celebrating and showcasing extraordinary people who are doing incredible things to make our world a better place. This is Close Up Television. I'm your host, Jim Masters, and thanks for joining us. On today's episode, we celebrate Penelope Smith. Communicating with animals telepathically throughout her life, Penelope discovered back in 1971 that animals could be relieved of emotional traumas and other problems through the same counseling techniques that have helped humans. The training and experience that have contributed to her success are her educational background, with bachelor's and master's degrees in the social sciences, as well as years of training and experience in human counseling, nutrition, and holistic body energy balancing methods. Research into animal nutrition, anatomy, behavior, and care. Plus, the first-hand education from the thousands of animals she's contacted. Since the 1970s, Penelope has been the founding pioneer for the field whose name she originated, Interspecies Telepathic Communication. Author of the popular classic books in the field, Animal Talk, When Animals Speak, Animals in Spirit, many audio recordings, and editor of Species Link magazine, Penelope has held the hub of the growing community of animal communicators worldwide for decades. Penelope's visionary work has been featured in newspaper and magazine articles, numerous books, and on radio and television in the United States and abroad. She has developed tried and true telepathic communication techniques, which complement current scientific knowledge and traditional methods. Her methods foster people's ability to understand and communicate with animals on many levels, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. As a world-renowned teacher of basic and advanced interspecies telepathic communication, she has helped launch the careers of numerous professional animal communicators. Penelope feels that the sacred connection we make through telepathic communication with other species is essential for human wholeness. Now to learn more about Penelope's incredible work, she joins me today in the close-up television studios for this exclusive interview. Penelope, welcome to Close Up Television. It's a pleasure to have you here. We've done the radio shows, which was fantastic, and wanted to dig in a little bit deeper, fascinated by your work. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> you know, I think what you do is so extraordinary and unique, and I'd really love in this conversation to break it down for people to understand the work that you do, the beauty of it, and how it all works. Tell us about this telepathic communication with animals. How, how do you really define it? Yes. So, a lot of times people, when they hear telepathy, they think, oh, well, that's something strange. But if you break down the word, you even get what it is. It's tele-distance, pathy feeling. So you're feeling across a distance. So it's the ability to receive feelings and thoughts and impressions and intentions. For, and we're talking about animals, so from animals. And it's actually a very natural ability that we're all born with to get others' intentions, to get their thoughts, to get their energies, to get right. their feelings. And our society kind of socializes us out of it mm. so that people then go into more into their left brain and go, oh, well, that isn't logical or it's not analytical and it doesn't. Whereas when you're younger, you just kind of go, oh, of course I know what the dog is feeling. Of course I know what the, the bird is feeling happy. And you don't deny it, but then it gets socialized again and again out of people. And it's really incredible to see people regain and recover their native ability because they get happier. Absolutely, <laughs> which is the bottom line, and, and there's nothing better than that. So yeah. you, did you realize, I know the 70s was a big time for you when you were doing the work, started yeah. the work, but as a kid, did you notice yes. these abilities? I always. You know, I never did not have the ability, I never denied the ability to telepathically communicate. I was kind of a loner. And and I loved animals. Right. So I would go and just sit in the little park nearby. I lived in a city, but little parks. And I would just talk to the animals and say, you can come to me. You don't have to be afraid of me. I won't hurt you. And so birds would land and insects would come and snakes would come out of the bushes. And I would just sit. They were like my little family. And I understood them. And it was never... Um, a doubt in my mind that they were living beings like me. 
that they were just like me, only they had different bodies, different right. costumes. Right. And so therefore, different role in the whole web of life, a different programming. But here we were, soul to soul. And so I never let people convince me. My mother told me I was very imaginative and, and you know, and kids made fun of me. So I learned to mm-hmm. just be, keep quiet. I didn't suppress it like most people do. Most people just suppress it and they go, oh boy, that's, we'll that's this, bad. Right. And we not only not discuss it, we'll get rid of it. And we'll do what the society says mm. is the right thing. Right. We'll talk in the language that other people are talking. And I just went, no, I'm not going to deny my friends. Am I going to go back to them and say, well, you don't think, you don't feel, uh, we aren't friends anymore. I said, no way. My dog, my cat, no way am I going to deny this. That was some of the most rich, tender relationships I had. Yeah. And so I didn't let anybody convince me out of it. So I just kind of kept it to myself. And it never disappeared. Did you grow up with animals in the yes. house? Pets? And yes. What did you have? Well, we had dogs and cats. We had parakeets. We had goldfish. And I just would go out and talk to any animals that I saw. So they were mostly in the city, like squirrels and birds and smaller animals. And, uh, and of course, the neighbor's dogs and everybody else. And... Uh, Yes, my family definitely was uh, animal oriented, but right. treating them sort of as subordinates, you know, right. as lower things. Pets, period. Yeah, yeah. And, and not as fellow beings that were walking together on the earth. We're doing our earth journey together, supporting each other. Right. And that's how I looked at it. I, I never looked at them as some, a thing. As a thing. As an object lower than me. It just right. was not in my repertoire. And then, um, you know, I just went, well, other people just don't remember. Now, did you push it aside for a while and then bring it back out? No, I never pushed it aside. It was always there. I didn't know it was going to be a profession. I mean, I didn't know, well, I'm going to be an animal communicator. expert at it. But my vision in life and my intention was always to help people to remember who they were, to, to have them be more enlightened. And so I just went in that direction. I went more into psychology and sociology and helping people. And then when I uh, became a spiritual counselor for people, and I was counseling people all the time, I discovered, uh, again, that uh, the animals responded very well to this. And how I discovered it, and as I explained in my book, Animal Talk, my um, basic book on how to communicate with animals, that... um, the same techniques that help people out of traumas can help animals. So I had a very graphic test of a, a cat who was very afraid, and I worked with her, and um, she had a wound from a cat fight, from cats attacking her, mm-hmm. and it wouldn't heal, and she kept scratching it open. And I worked with her, and in a short session, probably about a half an hour, I did the same kind of trauma techniques that help people get through traumas. I worked with her, asked her questions. She started rolling pictures of cats being after her, being very afraid of everything in life. She yeah. was afraid of people. She was All afraid of, of cats. It, yeah. And it started to roll and roll. And I'm going, wow, really fast compared to people. People will tell you things, and then right. it takes hours and hours to do counseling with people. Okay, she did it so fast. And so then she went to sleep. And, you know, and the next morning, it was like a different cat. Mm. Her her wound, which had expanded and her hair was starting to fall out, started to scab over and she didn't scratch it again. And within a week, her hair was growing back. It was almost totally, you couldn't even see. But the most amazing thing, and I had roommates at the time, they said, did you bring in a different cat? <laughs> she was confident. She went up to people. She jumped on their lap. She never did that. She always scattered, except for me. She scattered when people came in the room. She trusted me, but she didn't with other people. And then she wasn't afraid of other cats anymore. And so they didn't beat up on her. Mm. The amazing thing, she could go out it now, and she never so got hurt right. again. Yeah. She never ran away because she stood her ground. You know, And they, they probably thought it was a different cat, too. So I went, wow, 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 this is incredible. And I thought, I started to do the work with people, just with people who um, found out I could do this. And I started, it was really my practice time. I started doing and getting incredible results. And what I noticed is that people changed. 
they started going. When they realized that animals were spiritual beings, that animals had higher awareness, they started to realize that they also had more awareness. Oh, right. And I went, oh, wow, oh, wow, this is even better than what I'm doing now, even though it's helping people a lot and I'm you know, teaching people and educating people. But this, so I, it, it gradually turned into a profession. So that by, this was 1971, by the mid-70s, uh, I was going, uh, you know, full tilt. I mean, I mean, I was charging people. I mean, I practiced for years. I just did it on the side. And then I started going and then people wanted me to teach them. And then away it went. <laughs> so there, this is something that's teachable yes. for others. Yes. How does that work? Well, it's very interesting that people, because they've suppressed it, a lot of times it's suppressed under layers and layers of fear, of being told they're wrong, and no, uh, lots of lots of invalidated Societal, things. Yeah. Uh, yes, from their parents, from their um, other Peers. kids. It, it, you know, so... What happens is that people, when they start opening up this ability, they love animals. You know, the people that come for this kind of training, they already love animals. And they start to shed that other stuff, the stuff of I'm not a good person. I can't really do things. I'm not really intuitive. And all of a sudden, they start to be more empowered themselves. So it's, it's quite a miracle. So I just tell people, okay, I wrote steps for them so that they could learn how to make it a game, make it light, because they get very serious about it, and then it closes down for them. And then I wrote my book, Animal Talk, which has the steps of how people can open up to the ability. And then people start to remember, you know, and uh, do the courses, uh, do the trainings. Um, in the classes, people would start to go, oh, I remember I used to do this. And then it all starts flooding in. When I was a kid, I could understand them. And then I remember even when I suppressed it, when I felt it was dangerous. Right. You know, that I no longer could do this anymore. Right. So yes, people recover it. And some people have a harder time at it, especially people that have gone very left brain, you know, where they everything has to be sequential. And because this is, this is feeling. Right. This is about feeling another. Right. And opening up to feeling. So you have to open up to your own feeling. And then you can open up to another's feeling. And so people then have to shift gears. And it's, it's sort of like for, uh, for a lot of people, it's like crossing a chasm. You know, they, they suddenly make the leap and they go, there's a different world out here. And here's my dog who I've always loved, but I always felt different from, yeah. separated from. Right. Now... We're walking the path together. together. And my dog is telling me how I should live my life. And now I'm listening. You know, my dog is my guide. People, you know, realize that their dog or their cat or their bird or whoever it is has been helping them, they guiding them. They sense a lot of things yeah, yes. in advance of us. So it's really a natural ability. This is what I want to stress is that it's not something way out there. It's no, not yeah. something only a few people possess. We all have it natively to open up to and remember. And then, like, I'm good at it because I developed it. Right. I didn't stop it and shove it under, and then have to, you know, dig it out. So I developed it. Let's so, talk about how you developed it. I mean, through the education and the experience. Yes. Well, for me, I just never lost it. So actually, it was a little bit hard for me to first write and teach other people, because to me, there was nothing to teach. It was automatic. Yeah. It, it was just intuitive. There it is. The animals are communicating to you. You listen. And you get their feelings, their thoughts, etc. So I had to kind of go backwards. And when I wrote my book, Animal Talk, I wrote it very sequentially because that's how people operated. That's what they related to. So I wrote, do this particular step, then this step, then this step. But the, the amazing thing is, after 45 years or more since it was written, the steps still work. Mm. And animal communicators who have uh, generations of animal communicators are still using the material, still teaching it because it works. And so people can do that, go back to those basics and start to practice them and they rediscover it. And some people discover it again, rediscover it faster. They remember faster. So they start to go, oh, wow, I know what this is. Yes. 
and they just get it. And then other people struggle more. Can it be uh, any age too? Yes. And you mentioned that some people struggle more. Is, is there a wall of resistance that's causing them to struggle? Yeah, well, it's their socialization. I would say they were socialized that way, and a lot of their joy in living was also socialized out of them at the same time. Yeah. Because when you retune into the animals, the plants, the rest of nature, yeah. you get happier. It's a whole other thing. You know, yeah. I mean, all the studies say that now. Yeah. You just get happier. So a lot of people's happiness is and more, uh, has been pushed down. I mean, look yeah. at the mental illness in people, yeah. the depression. Right. You know, but when you reconnect with your animal friends, with the plants, with the rest of nature, then people get happier. So the people that have a lot of stuff squelched, you know, I Has mean, technology done some of that too? We're yes. depending more on the, well, technology more, than on relationships well, with uh, each other and it's animals. The more you speed up your mind, the more you go into the mind and speed things up. See, with this, you have to slow down. Yeah, it's more of take a breath, yeah. 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 Well, look at the animals. They will teach you. So your cat is meditating most of the day. And then they can become alert at yeah. an instant. And do it. Right? And, and there they are. And you, so people ha do have to learn how to breathe, center themselves, get grounded so that you can listen to another being. I mean, right. even people have a hard time listening to each other. They're yeah. always so speeded up in their mind their that they're putting thoughts into the other person instead of listening to the person. To what they're saying, right. Yeah. I told people when they were um, panicking about the pandemic and the COVID situation to get out in nature, yes. to go to the ocean, to right. go to the forest, be around the animals, be around nature, plant a garden, do different yeah. things because the animals and the ocean and nature as a whole doesn't know anything about pandemics or COVID <laughs> yeah. or inflation or any of the stuff we humans deal with. And it will be very grounding, very centering it's for you. you back to your and true nature. To the true nature. Yeah. And it's interesting you talk about the relationship with the animals because um, and maybe there's things I've been tapping into. It's always been for me, even as a kid, and I've been very aware of it, and other people have noticed it, where I'll say, for example, a bunch of friends of ours are going to somebody's house and there's a dog there. And we all walk in at the same time and the dog is growling at all the rest of them. But then I sit on the couch, never met the dog before, and it's on my lap licking my face. I have that with animals, horses, dogs, cats, birds. They'll come, like you said, they'll come right to me, want to be on my shoulder, my lap, want to be near me, follow me, and I'll have just met them. We were on a shoot where we were with horses, and, and the horse was... Um, you know, not really uh, communicating well with the owner. But when I came along, all of a sudden it was hovering around me. It allowed me to ride it. It wanted to throw her and she's with it you know communicating the key, all the time. You know what the key is? Is you're receptive. Yes. You're open. And I feel I you with the animals. Yeah. You're receptive. And they get that you understand. Them. I didn't see they them as less than. always know. Right. They I wasn't threatening. Know. I exactly. didn't see them as less you're than. Not, and you're also not pushing out a, a lot of things. See, yeah. a lot of people, they'll approach animals and they'll go like this Sit onto down, the do dog. This, do and, and they'll push him around or the, the, they'll impose themselves. Where you, The way you're talking, That's, I'm getting yeah. your pictures. You're just being. And the animals go, oh, I can melt into their space and be with That's them. That's what happens. They're like me. Do you know I also get that with seniors, I get that with people who are socially phobic, and I get that with children, with yes. babies, where they'll be in a carriage screaming at their mother, and then I'll peek behind the mother yeah. in the supermarket line, the baby, a little infant will do the same thing, then, peek around, yeah. and there's some sort of a communication that happens, right. and I've said, well, gee, you know, I'm older, they're younger, how could that be? And they're like, the age is gone. It's more of a human connection. And the baby starts giggling and smiling. It's and then the mother to tries to figure connection. out what's happening yeah. in this carriage. And then we'll peek again. And then I'll hide behind the mother. And <laughs> there's the. But it's obvious to me. You know, when, when, when you're talking about it, you can feel your energy very gentle. You're not pushing out at them. You're receptive. You're looking at them with welcomeness. Yeah, it's yeah. the same thing Enjoy. with me and many other people yeah. who have this is that the animals know. They get your thoughts. They get your intentions. 
and animals will come to me and they just calm down. They just fall asleep at my feet. And people go, wow, they're generally really frenetic. And, you know, they fall asleep at your feet and they just go, oh, and we meditate together. They want to be around you. Yeah. Yeah, They want that energy. So it is very easy for you to recover and remember your telepathic connection once you discover what it is. Right. See, for people like yourself who already have that nature, you've, you've cultivated it. Okay, so all they have to do is find out what it is. So they read my book or do a course and with other people or with me or whoever, and they find out, oh, this is what I've been, this is what it is. Oh, I it. can do that. Right. And they go, I can do that. I said, I know you can do it. Go forth and do it. <laughs> exactly. Then you practice yeah. and you get better at it. So, so you're, you're a perfect example. And how you're describing it is exactly how I describe how people need to be. You need to bring your energy back and down and just right. be receptive. And then the animals come, they've got a space to come into. They don't feel threatened or challenged. And they communicate to you. Right. Exactly. And they go, and they know you understand. I mean, I've had animals come up to me and go, wow, at last an intelligent person. You know, somebody who can understand, who isn't just spinning their own wheels. Have you ever had animals that are resistant to it? I don't find that very often. You know, I have had animals who were abused a lot, and people call me just after they're rescued. And I had one horse one. And so few examples I can remember them. Because animals, just like you talking about, they open up to me. They know you understand. I don't have any problem communicating but with them. And when people tell me, they say, well, you know, I'm having a problem communicating with this. I said, it's actually not the animal. It's, it's your approach. You need yeah. to just get more back and be less of... Um, pushing your own self out. Yes. And so I had one horse, I was telling you about the one horse, he, he just come from a very horrible abuse and the man had rescued him. And he saw me come and the man wanted to find out how he could help him more, what could he do. So I went there outside his stall and the horse moved to the far end, the little, little paddock, he moved to the far end and he said, you're a human, I'm not interested, humans are cruel. And you're just another one. And I, so I, I said, I understand. And I want to tell you why I'm here. And I was just, I stayed back. And I said, your person really wants to help you. And he understands that you've really been hurt a whole lot. But if you do not want to communicate, that's all right with me. So I started to walk away. The horse came running over. and said, no, no, I, I want to communicate. I said, okay, and you do it on your own terms, in your own way. Your person just wants to understand you better and how he can help you. And so that horse just talked and talked. So that's my approach. Well, I, I just always listen. I mean, my, I don't have one approach. It's always individual. You know, so if an individual um, is uncomfortable, then you, you bring your energy further back and you say, right, I'm not here to push on you. I'm not here to make you do something. How could you tell? What are the signs? Do they uh, growl? Do they Well, retreat? generally, uh, you know, beings, are, when they're afraid, uh, their bodies are... Tenses up. Tense. You know, they move away. Dogs may growl. You know, those are hurt animals. Those are animals that are hurting or they've been, they are checked out. You know, mm-hmm. you get some animals that have been so abused, they're not even in their bodies anymore. It's very sad. Do they, you know, sometimes I've heard this said a lot lately that some people will say people, humans sometimes, are not necessarily born with that empathy gene. Like, you know, we talk about empathy and the importance of kindness and empathy in just everyday life with each other, but some people just don't get empathy. They don't know how to express it. They've never dealt with it, they don't know what it really is, and that's why they seem so non-empathetic. Yeah. Are there animals that aren't? Um, I haven't experienced that. You know, what I've found with animals, even animals who are afraid, or like wild animals, they have yeah. to protect themselves. Yeah. They're, they're you hungry know? and yeah. Yeah, and they're surviving or they've been hurt by people. Okay, when, again, you don't push yourself on them, 
and you just be quiet and you can communicate at a distance. You don't have to have them in your lap. <laughs> you know, you can communicate at any distance and you just honor them and they see that you're honoring them. They come out and actually, Jim, the thing that I found is the greatest lesson that I've learned from all animals of any kind, domestic or wild, is compassion. Mm. And they have compassion for each other. They have compassion for humans, our domesticated animals in particular. Yes. They're here to help us. You right. know, they're trying to help us. Right. And they have tremendous compassion. They look at people and they realize, oh my gosh, the people are so confused. They're so ungrounded. They're so far away from it. So the dogs will say, "Go on, a, let's go on a walk," <laughs> you know, because they know the person needs that yes. in order to help them. Right. Or the cat will say, "Just let me sit on your lap and I'll purr and let's just meditate together." And when you start doing that, the animals have compassion for our difficulties. You know, I tell people that people have this thing about humans being superior. And so they go, well, there's the pyramid and hum humans are at the top of the, you know, whole food chain and the whole thing. I said, you know what that pyramid is? Is everything else underneath is required to help humans because humans are the only ones who forget who they are. Yes. And without all those other beings, humans fall. They forget it. They go insane. They have a lot of difficulties. They get ill. And the animals are still there remembering who they are, living life to the fullest, being the dog or the fox or the elephant that they are, and, totally, and teaching people by example Okay, how do we remember what it is to live a good life? To be a human, I mean, we're human beings, we're not dogs or cats, but we're all spiritual beings and we're all the same underneath the skin. You can look into the eyes of animals and you'll see the soul. Yes. And so how can we get back to that? Well, a lot of people find that if they're with animals, they feel loved again. Yeah. They start to it's feel what love is. They yeah. start to feel that empathy. They start to feel that compassion. Now, I understand that some humans are are very damaged. They're damaged by drugs that their their mothers had. They're damaged by a lot of other things in our society that cut them off from their natural empathy. I don't think anybody actually does not have that in their nature. It's just been they've just been damaged. They've been hurt a whole lot and cut off. So humans actually need the most help. Yes, that's so, so true. you know, people say, well, I want to get into this profession to help animals. I say, yes, it'll help animals. But you know how you help animals? You educate humans. Mm -hmm. You, you so help true. humans to understand, help humans to restore their compassion and their natural intuitive nature. And you know what happens? They act differently with their animals. They walk the earth differently. They no longer abuse. They didn't know they were abusing a lot of times. They no longer abuse the earth because now they have a different view. They have the, their na more natural view, like we're part of the earth. We're a part of the rest of nature. We walk with each other. And so that's why I say this is life-changing. It's life-changing and planet-changing work. Yeah, oftentimes, <laughs> people will see things that animals do, whether they've trained them to do something or just the way they respond, and say, wow, the animal's a lot more intelligent than yeah. we humans give it credit to be. And I've seen that, too, when you see dolphins, or you yeah. just see some of the extraordinary things that they instinctively do, which actually are for our aid and our betterment, yeah. betterment and our safety um, and our happiness and our joy. I think that animals are a lot more intelligent than we think they are oh, or we allow them to be. Well, if you're not open to it, you don't see it. Right. And now scientists, researchers are getting more open to it, and they're starting to go, Wow, these bees have complex languages. These ravens and crows and all these other birds, they're using tools. Well, they didn't notice that before. These other ones are playing. They have games. Uh, you know, and before they interpreted differently, they had this sh sort of shield. Broad like stroke approach, yeah. Animals are not, cannot be like humans. They can't have feelings. They can't make and decisions. Insects, they can't. And, and so they never saw it. So now, funny enough, the researchers are all seeing it. They're seeing the studies where um, people are getting better and more compassionate and more happy when they're around animals. Well, why?
Do you think maybe your animals are teaching you something that you're learning energetically right. and through feelings and also that you may be getting some of their thoughts about that you are really a good person? So people go, wow, my, they finally understand that your dog is showing you that you really are good underneath. And that all your socialization that told you how bad you were isn't worth keeping anymore. And so the animals can bring out your your truer nature. Your more and, and you can have more fun. I mean, how can you not have fun with these beings who are so playful and loving and keep coming back to you despite everything your misunderstandings, despite your mistakes that you've made with them, despite you looking at them as a thing. You know, and they keep coming back and going, you'll wake up. I'm going to persist. <laughs> it's a really, a truly amazing. You mentioned snakes and insects, yeah. things of that nature. Tell yeah. us about that. I mean, when people see a wasp nest in the eve, yeah. they panic. They want to get rid of it. They yeah. want it gone. What well, happens when a wasp nest forms on your house? <laughs> <laughs> well, the first thing, as an animal communicator, you communicate with them. First, it's you sit in your quiet space and you listen and open up. Now, if you operate by out of your fear, oh my gosh, the wasps are going to sting me. Let me give you an example. I had, uh, when I first moved to California, I'm, I'm living in Arizona now, but I lived in California for a long time. But I first moved, I had never, I saw these wasps going into the ground. I had never seen wasps going into the ground. And I'm going, what's in there? And and I saw that it was some kind of like almost like honeycomb paper. And I was so, all these wasps were streaming in there. So if I had operated on, out of fear, I would have gone, oh, we got to get rid of these wasps and oh, they're going to sting me. So I quietly went to the wasp and said, can I see what you're doing? Can I visit you? I, I'm just curious. I've never seen wasps going into the ground. And so the wasps were very stern, and they said to me, you can come in, come slowly, you can put your head in and see what we're doing, and then you must leave. You can only stay a short time. And I said, thank you. And with total respect, I went down, I put my head inside their hole. It was huge. Mm. It was filled with all, it was like papery yes, honeycomb, right? yeah. you know, like sort and of like bees make, but it was like, of yes, bees well, and... they were... Wasps were all around me. These were yellow jackets. I don't know if you know yellow they jackets, but yellow be, jackets yes, can be very, very aggressive. aggressive. So th they were surrounding me. The leader who I had communicated with told everybody she's okay. Is that the queen? Uh, no, I, I just communicated to what I call the oversoul or the leader. Um, the queen is very, very busy in there. I don't even know who it was. It was yeah. just the leader. And the leader told everybody she's okay. And she's, got, she's doing exactly as she's told. So I looked in. I saw, oh, my gosh, this is incredible. This goes deep underground. It's full of this, these, uh, this amazing structure. And then the leader said to me, okay, now you must leave. So I, again, moved slowly. And all the wasps were all around me. Nobody ever stung me. Nobody ever even tried to stung me. And I got up and I moved away. And I just marveled at it. Just totally marveled at it. But that's what communication can do. And I'll give you another opposite example of, again, this was with yellow jackets. And yellow jackets are like soldiers. They're warriors. Yeah, yeah. And I, uh, the yellow jackets, again, were in the ground. And I had brought one of my rabbits. I had rabbits as uh, companions out to, uh, she had an enclosure, but I brought her out to enjoy the sun. And I was just staying with her. And the, uh, she went too close to their hole mm -hmm. in the ground, and they went after her. Mm -hmm. And um, they covered her. Yeah, a It was very scary. And I, I went, oh, my God, she's there. they could kill her. This is it, yeah. And I just went to her, and I, I, with my hands, brushed I, them took off. Them, I brushed them all off. I took her back to her enclosure. I brushed her all off. I made sure she wasn't in shock. You know, because they had, oh, she has fur. Enough to, But, yeah. you know, made sure she wasn't in shock. She was scared. I put her back. And nobody stung me. And I went back and I said, um, I, I can't have this. You know, you can't sting my animal friends. I'm, I'm their protector. Just like you're the protector of your group, I'm the protector of them. And um, then they, um, 
didn't really listen to me on that, and they went after another of my animals. And I said, I'm sorry. After you. Yeah. No, yeah. no. And I, I said, I'm really sorry, but I'm going to have to do something. If you cannot, if you're right in my space. They were right near my house. I said, if you can make your nest somewhere else. But they said, no, we have a huge colony in here. We've made this nest. No, we're not doing what you want. I said, well, I have to protect my family. So that night, when they were all in there, I took diatomaceous earth, which doesn't poison the earth and doesn't poison, but it dries them all out. It dries out their nest. I put a lot of it. I put a lot of it in there. I said, I'm so sorry for doing this. I know you will propagate again. I know you will have, you will just distribute yourself among the others, even even as you leave your bodies. Uh, I can't have you hurting my animal friends. And um, they died. I mean, I was very sad about it, uh, but they never made a nest near my house again. They it. took it, yeah. and I said, you'll need to take it away. I, I do have to protect my animal friends. Sure, yeah. And, um, and that was that. So, again, um, communication. And some people will just very quietly um, meditate with the animals and, and ask them to leave, and they will leave. And then I have others, like ants that are in that They said, our colony was here. We've traveled this trail be- long before you built this house. This is our trail. This is our grounds. And so what I do with people, I say, well, just use non-toxic means instead of poisoning everybody. Just put a, with ants, it's, it's pretty easy. You can use a cayenne pepper or cinnamon and put a trail inside your house where they're coming in and they don't come in anymore. Yeah, try, to use, try to use the repellents and use the least. But again, listen to them. And many times they will vacate. You know, if it again, it isn't going to be a tragedy for their family and their colony, you have to look at it from all the angles. Like we protect our families, they protect their groups and families too. So uh, you work it out, but they're all intelligent. Let me just tell you, if you communicate to a wasp or a bee or any kind of insects, a slug, a snake, You will feel an old intelligence, and you will learn tremendous things. I mean, I can tell you so many tales of working with rattlesnakes and other beings that are really scary, and that, you know, my body kind of goes like this. and scorpions. Yes, and scorpions. (laughs) Yes, and they're beautiful. And so I regard them as beautiful beings, and we walk together. So, you know, I lift up a rock, and because I'm a gardener, and there's a scorpion. I say, oh, I'm so sorry, but I need to move this rock. So here, will you go over here to this rock? I'm not moving this one, okay? And c- cover them up gently with some uh, rocks uh, gently that are there, because they're scared to death that you're going to smash them or hurt them. And, and to me, they're all amazingly beautiful beings. And people can learn. See, people humanize. They think, well, if he doesn't work at a computer or doesn't drive yeah. a car, then they're not really intelligent. Right. I go, they have an intelligence that's, that's appropriate for their role in the whole of life. Right. And you can learn from their intelligence. And you can learn from them and their gentleness and their... Their sweetness, I will tell you, you meet a scorpion and the sweetness. You know, people go, oh, well, they scorpion sting. Scorpion sweetness, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, just or a shark sweetness. in the ocean. Exactly. Well, uh, sharks are totally amazing. Amazing because they have a whole different kind of sensors than we do. They sense energetically electric signals, electronic signals, but they sense in a whole different way. But they're, again, every being I've ever met is totally intelligent, whether they're a slug or or an elephant, or a shark, or whoever. They have a different kind of way of approaching the world, different senses. Senses that are way beyond ours. I mean, let's look at just a dog. There's no way we can smell like a dog smells. And they get they get the entire history of a place. Yeah. Why they spend so much time sniffing is they'll sniff too. that post, yeah. and they yeah. will get every dog and give me a picture of every dog who's been there how long it was when I can get the whole history of the neighborhood or if a rabbit crossed there my dog well we have a lot of wild animals so my dog will go rabbit coyote fox you know uh, as we're walking along and I get all the pictures from him smelling Mm. but their smells are like rainbows so I'm I'm saying respect the different kinds of intelligence it's just like saying 
other cultures are not intelligent just the because way we they're treat a different each culture. Other, right, or, uh, you know, what's that? That's crazy. They have their particular kind of intelligence that is absolutely brilliant, and so do animals. So, again, it takes a leap out of, you know, I get these comments sometimes on my Facebook page from people who just pass through, and, and they'll say, and I was talking about um, a praying mantis, and uh, I took pictures of them, and, and what the praying mantis was uh, thinking. And, you know, people make these comments like, oh, yeah, sure. Uh, and just like, oh, how boring. How boring it is. They can't talk about much. And I go, what do you mean talk about much? They're living, they're, they're sensing, they're experiencing life in this juicy, incredible way that's delicious. There's a closed minded. Yeah, so uh, who, that's the thing about, about you have to get out of their, your human yeah. socialization right. and get more into being a fellow being. Right. Just like you talked right. about your experience with the animals. You're being animals soul to soul. And children. And, yes, yeah, and with children. That, yeah. You're not looking at them as a thing. No. You're not looking at, well, they better be like me. Yeah. If they're not like me, then I don't like them. I've never well, been that way. Yeah. Never. In life, I'm not so that way. So this is what you need to do with all the animals. So do you ever feel like you're past- paddling in a boat in the opposite direction <laughs> of the current sometimes? <laughs> Probably, right? I, I will tell you that I don't operate like that. I go, people are awakening, and I'm watching over these years that I've been teaching, over these 50 years, I've watched people wake up more and more and more. And yes, there's a lot more waking up to do, but there are so many people who didn't look at animals as fellow beings before, and now they do. And now there's many, many more people that look at the trees that way. Now they're looking at the rivers are alive, the oceans are alive. Okay, if we don't, we're doomed. We're doomed. So we stay in our little narrow uh, spectrum of thinking. That we can control. Then we're in trouble. So anyway, there's so much joy in it. I mean, you know that, Jim. You get so much satisfaction when a wild animal comes up to you. I mean, what could be better? Or your dog, the dog, as you said, that was growling at other people, comes up to you and say, "Hey, now you, you get me." And sure enough, and what happens to you? Your heart opens. Your joy increases. Life is better. So I go, isn't that a good result? <laughs> I had when I was 11, sixth grade, I came home from school. I had a tropical fish aquarium. Uh, we had one in the den, but uh, then I had one in my bedroom. And, uh, and there was a mix of tropical fish, but there was this one goldfish that I had that uh, I had for a long time. And usually their lifespan isn't that long, but this one got bigger and bigger and it was just always there and it outlived a lot of the tropical fish and it was just there. I think the name was Wally. (laughs) And uh, I remember coming home from school one day and somehow Wally did some sort of a backflip or something and got out of the actual Mm -hmm. tank and was laying on the floor in the bedroom, right there just stretched out. And I, you know, 11 years old, I thought, he's gone, he's dead, that's it. And I don't know, I started talking to it, and I lifted it up, I put it back into the water, it floated a little bit, and it came back. Yeah. It came back. Most people would have thrown it right out or whatever they did. I said, that Wally has survived so many other things let me, it, this got to be. had the connection. And it so came back had, to life. Had, it actually came back. Yeah. It's like you it resuscitated that connection. it. And also, that's a very healing thing when you understand another being and old. you're talking to them and communicating with them. That is a healing energy that you're putting out. And so you acknowledging that being and giving him a chance to yeah. show what he was that, about. Here's another shot. Yeah. I thought maybe he flipped out of the uh, tank because he wanted to go to school with me. <laughs> <laughs> can, it can happen. <laughs> it can it, it can happen. Uh, no, they're really, uh, animals are really, uh, nature itself is exceptional. And like you say, the trees, and, and I'm in tune with all that too. Yeah. I mean, when, I, when there's a storm that comes through and these yeah. beautiful trees that have been there 200 years yeah. are knocked down and that's it, the life is over. Uh, when you see a tree go down or whatever, most people just, oh, guess let's get rid of it. To me, it bothers me when I see trees yeah. die or, yeah. or they're, you know, they fall over from a windstorm or something. Yeah. Uh, trees are amazing, too. They yeah. really are amazing. And communicate with them more because you'll find 
they're so benevolent. Well, you're a gardener, too, have, like Lady yes, F. Green and they Pound. have um, such a big, expansive perspective. And plus, they're connected to all the other trees. And what they survive, the weather, the wind, the heat, yeah. all the different elements, yeah. and then they lose all of the, they lose their winter coat, and yeah. now they are bare, and then they come back. Yeah. If you really study all of it, it's absolutely yeah. extraordinary. And... Uh, You've written books about all of these things, <laughs> and uh, you have all kinds of recordings, and you've done you have a lot of research on this. Tell us about the materials themselves. Yeah. Uh, when you're talking about the trees, is when I grow up, I'll be a tree. So you can look forward to that in reading my books. But I'll, t I'll tell you about them. So my, my first book was written in the 1970s when I was teaching people, and they said, why don't you write a book? We'd like to have this so we can continue to study it. And so I went, oh, wow. You know, again, it was sort of a backtracking for me. How do I teach people to learn something that's very natural? But I went, okay, this is where people are at. This is what they can understand and how to help them tap into the ability. You can't just say, there it is. Right. Go for it. No. You know, you need to so, of... yeah, you need to, to guide them back into remembering. And so I wrote Animal Talk to help people to remember. And it has a lot of stories in there uh, which shift people's consciousness and, again, take them back a lot of times to when they were kids. So besides the steps and, and that they can follow on how it works and how they can actually practice it with their own animal friends and with wild animals, there are uh, stories in my book, Animal Talk, that show you how animals are intelligent, mm -hmm. how they listen, and that when you communicate to them, they change. They shift yeah. right before your eyes. And you've noticed that uh, yourself, how animals change just by being receptive to them. They know that you understand. And then when you acknowledge whatever it is they're trying to say, just like I had that interaction with the wasps and with many domesticated animals, um, they respond, and they respond very favorably, and they shift and they change. So animal talk can give you a perspective, a remembrance, and then how to develop it. So you sit down, you learn the steps, you learn how to be present, get your energy calmer so that you can listen, and then you start to get the animal's feelings and sensations, and you learn what it is. So I call telepathy and in my book animal talk i call it extended senses so you take your physical senses and it's a bit more it's like fine-tuned you know they do these studies where they map the brain when people are doing this kind of work and they show that it's another vibration it's another area of the brain lights up and they show that it's a different kind of energy just like we can't see radio waves or microwaves right. okay they're or there wind. yeah they're there, but we can't see them. The same with telepathy. It's a finer tune. So when you're tuning into the animal, you can get their images. So the visual, you can get images from them, kind of like a movie or little photos. You can get uh, smells. You can get taste. You can get what they're tasting, what they're touching. So you can get it kinesthetically. You can feel it in your own body. And you can get what they're thinking. You get thoughts, which you translate into words. So, so I'm when I'm uh, listening to an animal, I'm translating it into human words. The animal isn't necessarily saying human words, although some animals pick up human words, but they aren't necessarily. But I instantly translate because that's what I do as a human. Okay, but I, and I'm good at translating as close as possible to the concept they're giving me, what they really want to say. And so that's how it comes across. So we get their intentions. You know, sometimes people will be doing these exercises that they get from uh, Animal Talk or in a course, and they'll go, oh, yeah, I have done this. I've gotten the horse's intention. That's why I ran out to the barn. I knew there was something wrong. And the horse is, t is t giving you that telepathically, is telegraphing, you know, putting out their intention. Help, I need help. I'm caught here. And they yeah. go out, and the horse is caught, and they got it. They got it. So then they start to recover, and some people become some people become very good at it very fast. And other people have to keep practicing, keep practicing, get beyond because there's a lot of doubts. There's a lot of stuff that has been put on top of people. No, you can't do this. No, you're not intuitive. Right, right. and they've seen images 
which are heartwarming and fun and, and joyful to watch, but like Mr. Ed, yeah. you know, and that type of thing where it's almost comical in a way, yeah. so they don't really uh, put the gravity to what is reality yeah. because they've seen images presented to them of things that are humorous and yeah. just you know, brush it off. Well, they start to think that the whole thing is humorous. So they go, animal communication, ha, ha, ha. Right. Well, no, ha, ha, ha. It's it's like I'm communicating to you. Do I go, ha, 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 and say, well, that was stupid. Jim can't understand anything. He's just a thing over there. You know, please. We just had this deep connection and interchange. So the same thing uh, people discover with animals. They go, oh, it's possible. I mean, how many times have people said to me, you mean they make decisions? I said, right. yes. Yeah, yeah. You mean they, they, they plan their life? They know their intention? You mean they're helping me intentionally? I say, mm, yes. That's why your animal friend came to you, because you needed that support. That's why I go, that pyramid that pe- everybody thinks the humans are superior. I say, no, we need all that support uh, underneath us. So that we can make it. <laughs> so we can, yeah, exactly, yeah. get through the days. Uh, you've got recording, audios, and all yeah. kinds of things. Let me tell you about the other your... books, too. Yeah. So there's uh, Animal Talk is the starter one. It's my basic classic book that people have used uh, pretty much, I, I think, every animal communicator. Now there are hundreds of them all over the world. They're all using this, these principles. And then I wrote When Animals Speak. And when animals speak goes much deeper. So it goes into um, not only communicating with animals, but also when we were talking about communicating with the trees and and the forces of nature and nature spirits. And it also goes into issues, problems we have with the animals, how to solve them, how to solve behavior problems, and also facing the issues of life and death. You know, all of us have to face that our animal friends are going to get old and die. Or get sick and die, and uh, it's it's there. So it, the when animals speak goes into depth on what animal communication is about. How deep can it take us? How deep are the animals? And so it takes us on a lot of journeys of in a much greater depth. So I recommend to people to start with animal talk. Go to when animals speak, and then you get the richness. Some people still tell me uh, animal. When Animals Speak is one of my favorite books of all time, and they read it again and again. It's very heartwarming and enriching. So it takes you on another level of the journey. If you want to go deeper, When Animals Speak. And then I have um, Animals in Spirit, which um, this is the one that people go to when their animals are dying and when their animals, they want to communicate with their animals beyond death. Mm. And so Animals and Spirit particularly focuses on that. And I'll tell you, people need a lot of help around this because death is not something that is an acceptable topic to talk about in a lot of our society. People want to just push it away. But you can't push it away with your little animal friend. You've got your cat living 15 to 20 years, your dog maybe 10 to 15 years, your, your little fish, you know, your, your bird. Uh, they're going to live, you're going to see them die. Yeah. And so it brings up a lot for people. It brings up a lot of um, emotions, a lot of mm-hmm. suppressed emotions. And people get really scared. They get really guilty. They feel, I, mean, I didn't do enough for them. Or they just want to push it away and get rid of the animal. <laughs> you know, they just can't deal with it. And so animals and spirit will take you into how the animals deal with death. What do they think about dying? How can you help them best? And then how can you communicate to them when they have gone beyond this earth? Because then people realize I'm not separate. I'm not closed off. That's an even bigger close off for people than being closed off in this, in this physical realm. And I'm not closed off. We're always together. And your animal friends can communicate with you. And it's so beautiful. And so it has a lot of messages from animals of what they have said to their people. And also it takes up the subject of reincarnation. 
that many times our animal friends will come back to us because we need more help than just one lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Of, of an animal's 10 years or 15 years. <laughs> Let's talk about the courses, too. You've actually yes. crafted and fine-tuned actual courses that people can take. There's more of the beginner, the basic, and then there's a, an, a mastery series. Tell yes. us about how that all well, works. Now I am not teaching my training program, but I have in audio recordings, I have put the basic course which you can take those audio recordings uh, available both on CD and digitally, and you can take them and follow along and do actually the course that I taught for years and refined and refined over the years that, again, still works very well, and do all the exercises that help you to remember, that show you what telepathic communication is and how you can work with it and and work with another uh person on it. You know, you can take another person and work with these exercises and then yeah. with your animal friends. Mm. And it's really quite remarkable. And then I have the Animal Communication Mastery Series, which then goes into um, people who want to go further with it. Right. So you have, you have uh, the audio recording on the basic steps in there, as well as going deeper into animal intelligence and awareness, who they really are, how they really think. How we are not so different from them, but also how we are different. But our commonality is souls. Then it goes into understanding animals' viewpoints. So people who want to uh, do this as a profession and they want to counsel animals, they start to learn, oh, this is how I can learn how to understand animals' viewpoints. This is how I can get deeper on it. This is how I can approach it. Because I have a lot of experience. I've talked to thousands and thousands of animals. I've done thousands of consultations with people and their animal friends. Plus, I've just talked to lots of different kinds of animals, wild animals and domestic animals. And so this experience gives people, and in the Mastery Series is also the healing and counseling uh, with animals. So how you can actually uh, do this to help animals, how you can act as a healing force, techniques that help you. And then how to listen even deeper, because when people start doing this professionally, you're going to run into a lot of problems people have with animals. Mm -hmm. So uh, people have behavior problems and they have um, medical problems. Well, medical problems are a veterinary problem, but there's an emotional side that you can help with. So you can help with the stresses, the emotional and spiritual side. Well, the vet works with the physical end. You can work with, okay, what kind of stresses were in the animal's life? How did it start? And they find, you find out all kinds of things, and you can help relieve those stresses. And the, working with a person, they can learn how to relieve the animal's uh, stresses. And also animals release emotions. Yeah, right. During these counseling sessions, my gosh, the changes that happen. So it's sort of like the psychosomatic elements behind the illness you can work with as an animal communicator. So I've got all that in my recordings. And <laughs> the benefit also is to for the person that's yes. involved, right? Because Always. there's a transformation that's happening in their life. Always learning. What are some of the things that you've seen happen and that have happened for oh, you? Oh my oh my goodness. It just oh, I have had people, again, who have sort of a, when they f first start out, they love their animals, but the animals are sort of distant. They're taking care of them, but it's sort of a distant feeling. And then as they learn more about the animals, and uh, of course they you know, have certain problems with the animals, and we find out what's going on from the animal's perspective, people start to go, oh my gosh. And they start to realize the spiritual nature of the animals and their own spiritual nature. So you get people who, it's, you can almost see the cages breaking, the bars mm, of their own cages amazing. breaking. And I'll have horse people who were trained to use force on horses mm. in ways that the horse is objecting to. And when they find out, and the horse gives a program, I mean, I've had horses tell me, if you work with me like this, I'll be happy to work with you. I'll be happy to jump and run. I love to jump and run. But I don't like it when you're jerking back on me or digging your heels into me or your body is tense. And they give the person a whole program. And I'll tell you that what happens to people, they just change and they start teaching people. Some of these people are advanced people teaching dressage or teaching other people. And they start to shift and they go, 
Let's approach the horse differently. Let's listen to them. Right. And uh, the change in the horses, I mean, I over and over again, I see the changes and they just do so much better. And they have hurts, too. You know, I'm, I'll give you an example of one uh, horse. The person was um, wanting to sell the horse. And uh, she had had the horse for a certain amount of time. And, and she wanted to sell the horse. She wanted to do another kind of activity that this horse wasn't good at. Okay, well, here she's about to sell the horse. But the horse gets very, very ill. The vet couldn't do anything about it. The vet did everything they could, and they said, I'm sorry, I, I, you know, we've done everything we can. So she called me, and the horse, I mean, is just hanging his head. And he says, I love her, and she doesn't love me. She mm-hmm. wants to get rid of me. And so I said, if I, if the horse said, if I get ill, she won't get rid of me. She won't be able to get rid of me because nobody will want to buy me. Right. And the horse was so sad. That was part of the illness. The illness. Just tremendous grief. And the person was like shocked. She was like, I, I can't believe this. I can't believe that a horse could feel this much. I mean, you could see her whole world was kind of shifting. And I said, yes, he, he really loves you and does not want to be so, kind of sold down the river. Away, and, yeah. and she said, well, I want to do this activity. He doesn't want to do it. So I asked the horse, and the horse said, well, we can do this. I, I can't do that activity. I'm not built for that. I, I don't like it. I don't like to jump, et cetera. But we could ride together. She likes to ride. And anyway, we worked it all out, and the person decided not to sell the horse. And they, she actually shifted so that they, had, um, they developed a new career together. Mm. I mean, so people shift, too. It's not just yeah. the animals shifting. Of course, the horse got happy. And lifted out. It wasn't it, the horse was not ill anymore. Right. And um, they had a life together. So this shows that the work actually helps with misunderstandings, yeah. behavior problems, yeah. psychosomatic situations, yeah. in relation to illnesses and injuries. Right. It, it's quite amazing what what changes. And again, you always refer to vets because vets have their job. That's what their work is about. Right. And so, but many times people refer to the vets, and the vet finds well the. Animals still not getting better. And then we find out that there's other things going on with the animal that um, need to be addressed. Yeah. Again, on the emotional end, on the spiritual end, that uh, can't be addressed necessarily by physical means. How long does it take for somebody generally, or is there no general way for them to realize that they have the gift of doing this. Everybody's different. You know, sometimes people will just tell me, and I have many testimonials over the years, they just picked up my book and they knew. They picked it up. They Nobody ever told them that this is what they were doing. This is what it was. Everybody else just said it doesn't exist. So they went, I'm doing this. They open up really quickly. And some people find out they have been doing it even much more extensively than they thought. Right. And so they catch on really quick. I have some really good animal communicators who just got onto it very fast. And other people have to work at it more. They've, again, gone in a different socialization or gone longer or have more left brain activity. They come from, they're now an ex- corporate executive, and they think in a whole different way, and they're constantly thinking. And, yeah. and so they have to move back mm. and rediscover a whole different way of being. So ev- everybody's different. I would say... You know, to get really good at it takes years. Yes. Right. <laughs> but to start out and to open can take a minute if you realize what it is. Are you still constantly learning, too, along the way, even though you've done it for so long? I would say you're always learning. You're always learning. I mean, every everything is individual. So whenever I talk to a new animal or, you know, again, in my daily life, I'm meeting different animals. I'm, um, you know, wild animals. And, and I just learn from them. And the delight. You know, I mean, it's always such a delight. People, sometimes people get scared about learning animal communication. They go, well, what is he going to say? He's going to say horrible things about what happened to him. And I will, t- I will tell you that animals really look at what's good is happening right. now. now. Now, yes, they have traumas. Yes, sometimes you have to go through that with counseling. Sure. You need a professional a communicator to help with you. But I will tell you, they focus on what's good. They, they don't 
uh, go, oh dear, that terrible thing happened to me, and keep repeating it in their heads like people often do, yeah. they go, wow, I have a nice home here, I have a yard, my person loves me, let's go for a walk. You know, so really, it's very, very positive animal communication. I'm not saying you won't discover some tragedies. Believe me, there have been times when the tears just flow down. And I just honor that animals have suffered a lot also. Absolutely. You know, and Sometimes you have to honor that. Sometimes separation anxiety. They've yeah. been taken away from the rest of their siblings yes. and family. And, and what about been, shelter animals and strays? Yes. How do you work with them? Well, I, most of my animal friends that I've adopted have been shelter animals or, or animals that are off the streets um, or been abused. And, um, you know, you work with them as they are. And there's that living wonderful being behind all the things that have happened to them and their spiritual nature and why they are with you. And when people discover that, why that animal is with you, how you can learn from them. A lot of the old traumas and the behaviors start to dissolve because you develop a new, deeper relationship. But I'm not saying it's not, you know, they, like us, can take years to get through some of those heavy-duty traumas. And you just have to understand that. You know, you have to understand that it can take it can take a while to get through. But I'll tell you what people do, what animal communicators can do, and what you can do when you recover your ability, is you can go into shelters and you can help animals to get adopted. Because a lot of times yeah. the animals have been abused and they're they hiding. They're, you know, they're cowering or they're, and people don't want to, don't reach out to them. So I, I did a basic course once with a whole bunch of students in a shelter and while in the morning, when the the people who were adopting came in the afternoon, so in the morning we had time to practice with the animals. So I said to the students, "Okay, we're going to practice. I want you to communicate with each of them, listen to each of them, be with them, but also let them know that they also have a, a part in putting out what kind of home they want and projecting out." what kind of people they want, what is their ideal situation, and to let them know that they need to come forward and welcome their people in. Well, it was totally amazing. First of all, the people were getting a lot of emotions and releasing, uh, from, and these are beginning students, uh, from the animals of releasing old traumas, but they were also finding the animals came forward, that cat who hid in the corner now came forward. Okay, in that afternoon, the, the shelter... Um, person told me, the head of the shelter, um, who had allowed us to do our work there, she said, our adoption rate was out the top. Mm. So also the message went wow. out to the people, your dog is here, your cat is here, come for them. And the animals were sitting there waiting in the front of the cages instead of going, oh dear, people are coming, oh dear, nobody's going to adopt me, because they've been abused and they've been thrown out. Yeah. You know, so she said, and so I, what I found is other animal communicators do these kind of programs, working with rescue and shelter animals, that the animals brighten up. They, they, they get more proactive about their lives. Because they also have a connection now. That's that right. We all need a connection. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And so they get empowered, as, the, as we say now, you know, they get empowered to go, okay, I want this kind of life. I want to have a yard. I want to have a person who loves me. I want to go at adventures in a car, you know, for a dog. Or the cat says, I want to be in a house where there's just one other cat. I don't want a whole bunch of cats around me, you know. And so then they attract that. And, and it seems to happen over and over again from other people too, not just from my experience, from other people. So you work with shelter animals. And you find out what's a good match, too. So other people are working, well, is this a good match? Is this animal uh, and this person really a good match? This animal says, I need a quiet home, and you've got five young kids. Mm. Mm, not going to work so well. <laughs> that might be a little bit of... <laughs> so the communication adds to that. Yeah. Uh, just adds to the ability of the animal to find the right home for them. Why does doing this uh, all these years bring you continued blessing <laughs> and joy in your life? I'll tell you, because without it, I don't know how people live without it. I mean, for me, I just walk with the animals. 
I walk with the plants. I walk with all the beings on earth. And it's just a joy. So I have a lot of wild animal friends. So I have rabbits who know me, and they, they pass it on to their, their kids. They say, you don't have to be afraid of her. So I have to watch out when the baby bunnies comes, because if their mothers have told them that, I have to watch I don't trip over them. Right, right. <laughs> and they look up at me and they go, Mom said I don't have to be afraid of you. And I said, that's right. And be careful, because I have big feet, and you're very little. <laughs> So to me, it's just a continual joy. You know, it is, it is storybook land. You know, I used to, when I was a kid, I used to say, you know, life on earth is very hard. I came from an abusive family, and my parents were alcoholics, and it was, it was really horrendous, and we were all abused. And so I would go, I would read the storybooks, and I would be with the animals, and I would go, you know, this is actually a lot better. I want to pass this on, that animals can communicate that uh, life is good and that we can be happy. And when you're with the animals, that's the messages that you get and from your own animal friends. And so I just went, okay, I have to get through. Obviously, I had a lot of work to do to uh, transform all that pain and suffering into love and understanding. Right. Yeah. Animals definitely helped me. And I would say that a lot of the people that get into this, they have also had uh, backgrounds like that. Of course, there's a lot of children that uh, have been abused. And so what happens is the animals help them to keep going. You know, they, they rescue them. We all rescue each other. We do. I say, you know, yeah. our rescued animals, we go, oh, I'm rescuing this dog. And I said, well, that dog is rescuing you too. And they said, and they realize that after they've been with the dog, they go, yep. And, you know, you see these uh, now videos on um, Facebook or YouTube or whatever of people going on trips with their cats. And they go, this one guy, recent one, so beautiful that people can see this, uh, these wonderful relationships. These people have the deep communication. And the guy who's a young man, he said, I don't know what my life would be without this cat. We have so much fun together. He teaches me how to really enjoy life. And I go, there you have it. Mm. There you have it. And the compassion and understanding this cat is just, you know, giving him love all the time, such deep affection. And I go, he knows what you need. You know what he needs. You're communicating with each other. What do you say when people say, oh, the only reason, why, and I'm sure you've heard this, the only reason why they're doing this, giving you the love and licking your face and, and hovering around you, is because they want to be fed. Mm -hmm. And that's it. What do you say to them? I, I would say that... Because you're the food source, so they're going to throw the yeah, love on you because you're feeding them. Yeah, but, you know, then let's apply that to ourselves. Do you just love people because they feed you? No. I mean, no. you know, I, I go... I do love my mother's cooking, but I love course, her first. Of course, any <laughs> healthy animal, human animals, any other kind of animals, loves food. If they don't, they're not a healthy animal. Yeah, right. I mean, it's, it's yeah. a natural thing. To enjoy it. We love because we love. We're made of love. Mm -hmm. And so the animals, it's real natural. Yes, of course they like their food. Of course they want to be fed. Yes, it's fun to feed animals and give them their treats. But they just love us. My animals come around. It's not mealtime. They're just with me. We walk together. I mean, if you don't know that from being with your animals, you're not really being with them. They want to be with you. Now, if you're an abusive person, well, then it's a different story. You know, at least you give them food. <laughs> but if right. you're not, I mean, the kind of people who come for animal communication are not generally abusive people. They're people who love their animals. So I just think it's kind of um, missing the whole point of why we gravitate to each other. Why do we gravitate to each other? We want to help each other. Yeah. We want to we wanna feel each other. We want to connect. Right. We want to communicate. We enjoy each other. Right. I mean, hey. <laughs> want to be a part of. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. we feel part of each other, whether it's a human or a dog, a cat, an elephant. Like I said, one of the greatest privileges is if a wild animal who knows better than to be around humans because it's dangerous, if they come up to you, it's like... And you see that videos of that where yes. people are, you know, the with greatest lions incredible and cheetahs. joy. 
or animals who are just out there walking in the wild. I mean, I'll just connect with them. And we'll just connect, and we'll just walk together. I've walked with coyotes like that. We just look at each other and say, I'm just walking with There's you. There's a respect that's yes, there, too. Yes, exactly. It's important, the respect. That's part of my, I have these list of tips, pointers, on how to inc- enhance your telepathic communication in my book, Animal Talk, and in my basic course. And one of the first ones is respect animals as fellow beings. Without that, you don't get anywhere. You will not be able to open up to communication. If you're looking at them as lesser or things, you won't open up. So respecting them as fellow beings and see what they can teach you. Mm. See what you can learn from them. Oh, it's such a wonderful world. Let me just tell you, I mean, again, I cannot emphasize enough. Without this, I really feel that people have a, a deep loss and sadness. Without this connection, there's a big missingness. And somewhere along the line, people will realize it. Mm. Or they will have the diseases of our society, the mental illness, the depression of our society, if they don't connect with the rest of nature and realize that we have a lot of friends, billions, billions of friends. That are there. (laughs) That are there, yeah. And they're all there. And if we walk with them in a different way, life uh, life is enhanced. We can be more joyful, and the planet is better for it. <laughs> like Dr. Duda Little said, yeah. right? Walk yeah. with the animals, talk to the animals. Yeah. It's so important. This was really amazing. This was eye-opening on so many different levels, and I'm in tune, as I mentioned, with some of the examples that I've expressed that I knew about early on, about the way animals, children, and others uh, respond to me, and I respond to them. And uh, I think this is really incredible work that you're doing. Well, it's a work that needs to be done right now. And you can teach others to yes. do it as well. Yes, and they teach others. So it's now generations. There's a passing, <laughs> it's passing, passing, it forward, it's right? passing it forward. It's passing it forward, and now there's really millions of people that have been exposed to this. And now there are hundreds, if not thousands, of animal communicators who are helping others. Right. So I would say the importance of it in our time is what... It makes it almost urgent now is that unless people connect, unless they reconnect with themselves as part of nature, we're, we're lost. We're polluting the earth. We're polluting our own home. We're poisoning ourselves and everyone on it. If we shift that, when you communicate with animals and plants and rivers and mountains, you the no ocean. longer want to end the ocean and all, all life, all, all the elemental forces, like go out in the storm, in the wind and communicate with that being, well, you no longer want to do harm to them. Right. You, you realize you're part of them. They're helping you. You're helping them. This is all a part of the cycle of life and death on this planet. And let's live it the best we can while we're here. Why, why would we want to poison no. what supports us? That's right. And so if we shift and we communicate with all the other beings, then we certainly don't want to hurt them anymore. What's the overall takeaway with all this work? I would say that it's an ability that when regained, restores a chunk of our hearts and souls and helps us to be happier and helps us to live in a way that other beings around us can be happier and our planet can live in a beautiful state again instead of the state of um, polluting it yeah, and hurting it. Right. And so that's, a, that's the big takeaway. Let's all do it. Let's, Let's do all it. do it. That's it, right? <laughs> and have fun. That's it. <laughs> Sign us up. This is amazing. Thanks for coming to the studio and being so open, real, authentic, and passionate and joyful <laughs> for this work, because yeah. you can see it. You can, I can feel the energy, the warmth, and the vibe that you are all in. You've been in for years, yeah. since a kid, yeah. and uh, this is very deep for you. Yeah. And it is for others who you've been able to and sort when, of invite to appreciate. And when I see all the people that have learned, it's you know, they're yeah. so beautiful. Yeah. I, I call all my students my little chickens, you know. Right. <laughs> I go, right. But I think of the earth that way, you know, little little chickens, you hold them under your wing and you go, okay, come on, right. wake up, be yourself, enjoy life, and then go out 
and go out right. and use your talents and use your ability to share awaken other beings. World. Share it. Yeah. And then we're all better for it. This is a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Thanks for sharing it with us on Course of Television today, Penelope. It was fantastic. Thank you, Jim. Continue joy and success in all that you're doing, and uh, keep us posted on it all. Yeah. Thank you, Jim, so much. It was really a pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. If you'd like to learn more about Penelope Smith and her extraordinary work, visit this website, animaltalk.net. For close-up television and radio, I'm Jim Masters. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again next time.